Good morning. If you would, open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And that's where we'll be starting today, but I first of all wanted to point out that there are so many passages and chapters in the Bible that immediately bring something to mind, like 1 Corinthians 13. Most people would know that as the love chapter. Psalms 23, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Exodus 20, you've got the Ten Commandments. Matthew 5 through 7 is the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Genesis 1, the creation. And some people bring different traits to mind as well. For example, Judas Iscariot, you certainly think of betrayal. Adam and Eve's son, Cain, murderer. Uh, Peter, the denial of Christ Jesus. And Daniel, the the dream interpreter. So now, if I mention these people, tell me if anything comes to your mind. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, David, or Samuel. Those are the people singled out in Hebrews 11 as faithful people to, toward God. I've heard that, that chapter called the Hall of Faith. I've heard it called the Faith Chapter. But certainly, the elders, the leaders of the Jewish people back in the Old Testament times were certainly noted for, for their faithfulness, the ones I just mentioned there. And initially, my plan was that I was going to go through and talk about those people and kind of go back to the Old Testament and study what what they had done to be called faithful. But then last Sunday, Charles announced that Jim was going to be teaching at 11 and that his, he was going to do a continu continuation in his study on faith. And I thought, well, what if we get too close and step on each other's toes? And then I thought, well, if that happens, I'm sure God intended for it to happen. But as I got back into my studies, I hit two words that really captured my attention and started me off in a completely different direction. So I do encourage you to read the entire chapter, Hebrews 11, and then go back with references to see what those people did in the Old Testament times to, for God to call them faithful. But today, we're going to be studying, uh, start out with just verse 1 of Hebrews 11. And it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that's, it's not a, that's not a real clear, understandable statement. It, it causes, I think, a little confusion, at least for me it did. And so I hope as we kind of dig into this today, we can study faith and hope, and God will help all of us to better understand the differences, the similarities, and whatnot. So again, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if you don't mind, let's uh, have a word of prayer here just before we get into the word. Lord, thank, thank you for the opportunity we have to get together. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to stand here and teach. I just ask that you would help me to have the words you would have me to say. and. The folks here that have open and receptive hearts and hear what you would have them to hear and not necessarily what I say in a feeble way. Just thank you so much for this congregation, for our pastor and Tamara and for their service to us and to you. We thank you for their leadership. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. In my mind, that almost sounds like a mental wish. You know, hope for this, hope for that. I think when we were all in school, we sure hoped for good grades on a test. As we got into adulthood, we hoped for a good job. Just so many things that we would hope for, and it really was nothing more than just a wish in the, in the worldly, earthly fashion. Hoping for good grades certainly didn't guarantee good grades. Hoping for a good job didn't guarantee a good job. You had to work at it. You had to, had to apply yourself. 
I could stand here right now and hope, hope, hope all day long for cooler weather, but I guarantee you that's not gonna lower the temperature by one degree, no matter how much I hope. So we need to understand the biblical references to hope as well as the, the earthly or day-to-day -day uses of the word hope uh, here, here on earth. Uh, scriptural hope that we find in the Bible is far more than just a wish or hope. Christian faith, faith in God and his son is far more than hoping. Uh, the secular dictionary says that faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. I don't know of many people on earth that I could put complete faith and trust in. So there's always that faith that you have faith in somebody, but not maybe not total and pure faith. Uh, that same dictionary defines hope as to look forward to with desire and reasonable confidence. Now I'm here to tell you, Christian faith, faith in Jesus as our Savior, is not something that I have with reasonable confidence. I have it rock solid certainty that Jesus died on the cross, that he is my Savior. Uh, but there's a subtle difference between those two definitions. Faith is complete trust or confidence, hope is a reasonable, a, a desire and reasonable confidence. So there's a little bit of difference there. Hope in today's world conveys doubt. In the biblical sense, there is no doubt. It's rock solid. It's a certainty. Uh, and then at the end of Hebrews 11, 1, it's got that little caveat, the evidence of things not seen. What exactly does that mean, the evidence of things not seen? Let's think about it for a minute. We all know that air is out here. It's everywhere. But have, has anybody ever seen air? You may have seen fog or dust blowing in the wind or pollution or some other evidence of the air, but you have never seen air. But by evidence, you know that it does exist. What about the wind? I often say, you know, I'll, I'll see the trees just going crazy, rustling, and I'll say, look at the wind. You can't see the wind. You can see the evidence of wind. That is evidence of things not seen. And one last example, natural gas. You know, so many people have that in their homes. You cannot see natural gas, but you can sure have evidence of it. If you have a leak in the pipe, you can smell it. Or if you turn on the burner, you can see the flames and know that you have evidence that that gas is there. We have faith and trust that the wind is there, the gas is there, the air is there, because we do have evidence. Um, there are countless other examples like that that we, we know that they're there, but we can't see it, but we do have faith and, and evidence because of, faith because of the evidence. Christian faith is a very firm belief. It is evidence, it's knowledge within your soul, your heart, your mind, that it's, it's basically just a rock solid belief. Faith is foundational to the Christian life. Faith and hope. Both words are used in Hebrews 11.1, 1, but are they interchangeable? Are they different? Do they have different meanings? Uh, today, a lot of the times, we seem to use those words almost interchangeably, but I think that when you get into it from the biblical sense that there are differences between the two. Uh, if you would turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at hope first. And 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13 says, Wherefore, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you unto, brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I want to stop right there when it says, hope to the end for the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At first, that sounds almost like that wishing kind of hope that I was talking about, but 
absolutely not the case. Peter's basically saying, don't be half-hearted in your belief, in your study, in your hope. He's saying be complete in your hope all the way to the end. So that's, I just wanted to clarify, clarify that because it, it does sound almost like the, the wishing. Uh, verse 13 again, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of person judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of this world, but was manifested to you, manifested in these last times for you. And here in verse 21, who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. There's the two words that we're studying again together in the same verse. Just like in Hebrews 11, where we found faith is a substance of things hoped for, <clears throat> and the word hope in the New Testament, I looked it up in Strong's Concordance, and it says that it's from the Greek word elpis, according to Strong's Concordance, that means expectation, trust, and confidence. And it comes from the root word elpo, which means to anticipate with pleasure and to welcome. And I think it's important that we really focus on anticipation with pleasure because we're going to see a little bit more dealing with that in a little while. If you would turn to Romans 5, and if that sounds a little bit familiar to you, it seems like every time that I stand in the pulpit here, I always wind up going to, to Romans 5, and I make no apology for that. Romans 5, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there it says, uh, having been justified by faith. So that's one of our words there is faith. And that is past tense, having been justified by faith. It's certainly something that has already happened to us back when we accepted Jesus as our Savior and believed in Him for eternal life. At that very moment, we were cleansed and justified through our faith in Him. Now continuing with Romans 5, uh, verse 2, through whom also we have access to faith, and that's present and future tense, into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope and the glory of God, that's future tense, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And again, that hope is also future tense. And verse 5 is again future tense for the word hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You remember when I was talking earlier about hope for good school grades or a good job? Uh, and so many times when we had hope in earthly things, in materialistic things, we were disappointed. We didn't get good grades. We didn't get that job. There was disappointment there. But we just read in verse 5, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which, who was given to us. The eternal promise of hope, God's promise to us, does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out to us. Hope is a future confidence. Hope is used in the Bible 
related to very distinctive Christian experiences, but they're always in the future when it's dealing with hope. Uh, hope does not disappointment, disappoint because it's rock solid. And if you would, turn over just a few chapters from where you are <clears throat> in Romans 5. Let's look at Romans 8. And this is where we're, if you read the text before, we're rejoicing because we are fellow heirs with Christ. So start with verse 20, Romans 8, verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futili futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it to hope, because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. And verse 24, listen closely here. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is not seen, I'm sorry, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with perseverance. So right there, it says we eagerly await. And we're, I was talking earlier about the word elpis and how we, that means to anticipate with pleasure. And I think anticipation with pleasure goes hand in hand with eagerly awaiting for God's promised uh, salvation. We just read in verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with preservation, per perseverance. Biblically, we know that our hope is in the Lord. Why does one still hope for what he sees? Uh, John Piper is a national, nationally known uh, preacher and although I don't agree with a lot of what he, what he stands for, not a lot, some things he stands for, there are certain things that he's written that I truly have to agree with, and I found a quote here about this. It says, when we say that hope does not see what it hopes for, the reason it doesn't see it is because it hasn't happened yet. Again, I was talking earlier that hope is always in the future. So uh, it says we wait for it with patience, so that's the distinctive mark of hope. It's always future-oriented and consists in a firm confidence of what we are hoping for, not just a wish. Biblical hope is biblical faith in a future tense. And I thought that was really kind of putting it all into, into really understandable terms. If you would now turn to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2. We're going to begin with verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. The blessed hope of the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Again, that's future tense. But how much more hope can there be than that? So far, we've primarily focused on hope, but now let's move over a little bit into faith. And again, there's similarities, so some of this may be repetitious. Pretty much everything that we've Talked to, that I've talked about today about hope can also be said about faith, except faith is not always future tense. We have had faith, and we have faith today, we continue to, but faith, I think, is even a much larger concept than hope. Christian faith is not only belief and trust that Christ will keep his promises to us in the future, but it also says 
Lord, I know you died for me, for my salvation 2,000 years ago. I believe that, and I have faith in your death, burial, resurrection as my means of salvation. And in return, Jesus says to me, Yes, Robert, I died for you. I bore my Father's wrath for your sins, past, present, and future. I can't hope for something that's already happened 2,000 years ago. So I can't hope for salvation. I can have faith and knowledge that I have salvation through the promises of Jesus Christ. Remember, biblical hope is always future tense. It's faith that allows me to believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's faith that allows me to call him my savior. And through faith, I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved in the future. It's ongoing faith and confidence. And because of that, I do have the blessed hope of seeing, and seeing Jesus and spending eternity with him in heaven. Uh, let's turn to... Now, I'm not going to turn there, but Psalm 42, we're called upon to have hope in God even when our spirits are down, even when our enemies reproach us. But if you would, turn back to... Uh, now, I'm sorry. Let me, let me read another quote from John Piper on faith. I, I read one earlier on hope. But this one he writes on faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Uh, he says, Hebrews 11.1 1 says that the substance of that future thing hoped for, the future reward or blessing, some substantial essential element of it is experienced now in what he calls faith. Faith is experience of the substance of that future reality known, believed, tasted, and cherished now. So basically, what that's saying is that faith faith is something that we can experience day in and day out. We, we know it, we taste it, we, we experience it, and we cherish what he's given to us. So often, critics of religion will define faith as a blind leap of faith or a desperate lunge into darkness. So many times during uh, times of trouble, tr times of troubles, we're told, just have faith. That makes it sound like you can squeeze it out of a tube like toothpaste, but that's not the case. You need to have faith constantly and trust. Uh, Any time that you lower that, the, the view of faith to that level, I think it reduces the Christian conviction to religious wishful thinking, and that is not what faith is all about in the Bible. If you would, turn with me to Luke 17. We're about to read about the apostles' desire for more faith. Luke 17, beginning with verse 1. Then he said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed yourselves. If your brother sin against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he, forgives, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. These were people that were alongside Jesus every day. They saw his miracles, they heard his teaching, yet they were asking for increased faith. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time that you prayed and asked God to increase your faith? I think it's something we don't do nearly enough. I think it's something we should do far more. And I'm not talking about just whenever you have a burden. I think we should daily pray for increased faith, increased trust, and a lot of that comes through study of the Bible. I'm going to get sidetracked here just a little bit, 
That passage contains a stern warning that no one should do anything to offend the young believer. When it says uh, the, the reference to children, it's not really talking about children as we think of them. It's talking about the young believers, but it certainly doesn't exclude children. It's talking about anyone who is, who is a believer but not well versed in the scriptures and we should do absolutely nothing to ever offend them or to deter them from their studies. Uh, I think we need to pray for increased faith but pray that we never ever do anything to offend anyone especially young believers and it's not up to us to decide who is a Christian who's a believer and who isn't so I think we have to just assume as we're going about this that we need to not offend anybody uh, that passage also talks about warns us to forgive and forgive again and again it said if somebody offends you and they come and apologize you should forgive them if they offend you seven times or if they sin against you seven times the same day and seven times they come and apologize or or ask for your forgiveness that you should forgive them so i think basically that's telling us don't ever put a limit on how much you're willing to forgive somebody uh, something else and, and I'll get back to faith and hope very shortly but you remember in Matthew 6 what we everybody commonly calls the Lord's Prayer and I think it's so ironic because right before the, that Lord's Prayer it, <laughs> Jesus says whenever you pray don't use repetitive words but this is how you should pray and he gives it as a basic example he doesn't say this is a prayer you should repeat every time you go to the dinner table or whatever. But yet that's basically what it's turned into. Uh, in that, I'm sure you remember, it says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Have you ever stopped to think about that? You're asking God, when you say that, you're asking God to forgive you like you forgive other people. Is that really what we want? I don't think so. But even so, that part we know and it's recited far too often. But the next verse after what's called the Lord's Prayer, verse 14 says, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness of others is vital to our Christian walk. I didn't say it was easy, but it is vital. All right, getting back to uh, our faith and hope. Uh, I've heard it said on occasion that we can hope, but we can never know for sure. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That, that is absolutely not true when it comes to biblical thinking, biblical scripture. Uh, the biblical word for faith means active trust. Knowledge builds confidence. Confidence leads to trust. And the kind of faith God has interest, that God is interested in is not wishing. It is based on knowing a sure confidence grounded in evidence. If you would go back to Hebrews chapter 12 this time. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, starting with verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and a sin which so easily ensnares us or besets us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, uh, for cons consider him who has endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. What joy did Jesus get from being crucified on the cross? That, it, it tells us right there that he had joy in his time on the cross. 
I think God had assured Jesus that the other side of the cross, after enduring the suffering, the pain, the humiliation, that he would inherit great joy. And Jesus had hope in his Father's promise of joy. Why did he have the hope of joy? Because faith in God's promise. And I think that that joy also comes from knowing that he was redeeming so many people in future times from the curse of death and, and spending eternity in hell that he was offering the chance for them to, the opportunity for them to spend eternity with him and with his father. Uh, back to Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. After this study, I still, I, I realize there is a difference between faith and hope. I think they can be used interchangeably sometimes and not other times. Uh, faith provides substance and faith provides evidence. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7, we read, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from or absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And when Paul says there that we're away from the Lord, all that means is geographically. We are, he's in heaven, we're on earth. So we are separated from him, but by faith we can still walk with him and have him in our life constantly. And here's a question I have for you, and I'll tell you up front, I don't have the answer. But I challenge you this month, uh, this week, to try to find the answer in the Bible. Uh, I found something that may be an answer, but I'm not sure. So I'm not going to state it as fact. But what happens when we get to heaven and see Jesus face to face? Will faith and hope still exist? Right now we have faith that... He, in his word that he's preparing a place for us, we live for that blessed hope of being with him through eternity. When we die, is that the end of our faith? Is that the end of our hope? Hebrews 11 says, substance of things, now faith is a substance or the realization of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. After we die, Jesus Christ will no longer be things unseen. We will see him face to face. Again, I don't have the answer, but I challenge you to try to find it and let me know what, what you find. If you remember, in Romans 8 we read, hope that is seen is not hope. So why does one still hope for what he sees? In heaven, we will see Jesus face to face, so we no longer need hope to believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, in heaven, I'm not going to need faith to say that Jesus is the Son of God and to recognize that I am there with God. Uh, instead, it's going to be a statement of fact. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, I can say that as if as a statement of fact now because of my belief and my faith and my trust. But again, I will have seen it and know it firsthand. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know him just, also, just as I also am known. Now, Verse 13, if you, this is where I think I might have the answer, but if you carry that thought of now I see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. The next verse says, and these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So what I don't know the three of these remain, uh, th these three remain, faith, hope, and love. I don't know if that means that they will remain in heaven as we die and, and move into heaven with God. I just don't know. But I know one thing, without any doubt, heaven is going to be so much different 
and so much better than our time here on earth. I tend to believe, as I said, that faith and hope, once we get to heaven, will be replaced by knowledge. And I think it's going to be a, a knowledge that uh, no one could argue with. But again, I'm not, a, I'm not a Bible scholar, not by any means. I, so many times I wish that my dad or Judd Lively were still around to ask questions like this too. But it, it, I, I guess we'll all know the answer to that in, in, own, in our own due time. Uh, we're going to be living in a worry-free, pain-free, perfect world in heaven with, with God himself. I just don't understand what could be left for us to hope for. We're going to be there experiencing it. It doesn't take faith when you are, are living it day in and day out. One thing I do know of is that the blessed hope promised in Titus 2.13 when Christ shall return and those believers that have died, their bodies are going to be raised from the dead and joined with their soul. Then the bodies of believers that are still living will be changed into a body like the Lord's resurrection body and meet him in the air to be taken to heaven. Faith is a gift to us during our time on earth. Faith is one of the most important aspects of Christianity in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tell us precisely that. So as we close, if you would, turn to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. A lot of you won't have to turn there. You know it by heart. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. By grace we're saved. And it's through God's own grace that we've been saved through faith. Without faith, we have no hope. Without faith, there's no salvation. Without faith, there is no eternity with God. We need faith in God. And we need to sh share that faith and, and the gospel message to all those unsaved around us. If you would, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time of fellowship. We just ask that you could take the words that have been spoken and apply them as you would have them to be understood. We know that there's so many things in the Bible we don't understand, but we do need to just continue studying to work on figuring out the different things. We thank you for salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. We just thank you so much for your love for us, the way you've blessed this church over the past 70 plus years. We pray for other churches that have been around longer and those that haven't been as long, but that do proclaim the true gospel of the grace of God. Just thank you so much for the privilege we have to come to you with prayer. We continue to pray for those that are sick and suffering and ask that you would heal them in accordance with your word. It's in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen.